and welcome to the MBS Show Reviews. I am your host, Norman Sanzo. Joining me today is the man, the myth, the hippogriff, Silver Quill. Silver Smash Beauty Yaks. <laughs> uh, and also joining us is... Uh, she doesn't want to be renowned as the Pokemon thingy. Okay, um, what, what, what does she do? What does she do? What does she do? Ah, we have someone blue. Sapphire Heart Songs. I would have been just fine with Pegasus with oversized bird rings, but okay. <laughs> and I'm going to be here to manipulate you all into my submission because we're friends. Yep. <laughs> and also joining us is the Call of Personality, Toon Critic. Yo, what's up? I'm more awake this time. <laughs> Yay, like, this is a week away. People won't know that. <laughs> no, no, no. So anyway, how how is everyone doing? Solution. I know. Uh, so how has been everyone doing? Uh, well, uh, enough. Bringing yeah. darkness, confusion, uh, Oh, by the way, how was BronyCon? <laughs> Oh, it was a great time, especially with that one thing, too. You remember that one thing, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was that one thing. Oh, man, you did that really cool thing. Oh, you remember that one thing that we did? Oh, my gosh, it was amazing. Ah! Oh, that is so going up on YouTube. Oh, yeah. Wait, I thought we agreed never to talk about that. I still have, I still have nightmares. It's the other thing. It's the other thing. Uh, and as, as you can tell, I survived Australia. Yay. I only met one animal that tried to kill me. It was a cute little kangaroo. And boy, did he pack a wall up. Oh, hey, those kicks can kill you. Indeed, indeed. So, yeah. today, like we mentioned before, we are going to review My Little Pony, Friends Forever, issue number 26. Original published date, March 16, 2016. And March 23rd for the scheduled version. Oh, yeah. This is strange. But anyway, uh, written by Jeremy Whitley, art by Tony Fliss. Fleece and colorist by Hedda Breckel. I've often been confused. Is it Tony Fleece or Tony Fleeks? I don't know. I say Fleece, but I'm Asian. I could be wrong. I will have to pay attention the next time he's at a convention. They'll announce him. Is he going to... <laughs> he was at BrodyCon, right? He is at yeah, BrodyCon. Yeah, I mean, like, next time when you meet him, you can ask. <laughs> I've not gotten to meet him. Well... <laughs> Yeah, he got a picture and everything. That was at BabsCon a while ago, but I didn't go up to a guy and say, Hey, how do you say your name? Well, <laughs> well, you could do it now and tell the whole story of um, when the show we were trying to introduce you and I was wondering, like, which one should we say? Because my co-host always say Fleece, or is it... And I thought it was Fleesk. Oh, no, not Fleesk. That's, that's like giving someone a pat down, I think. <laughs> oh, that's Frisk. Uh, no, Fleeks. That's how I say it, please. Yeah, see... But, you see, I've got to find a diplomatic way to ask about this, which is a great segue into Diplomacy Issue. Ah. And that's the theme for this week's comic review. Uh, how to put this? Like, the Shining Armor and Prince Blue Blood are forced to go to Yak Yakistan. The reason is, they are in diplomatic talks with the Yaks. Something to do with trade routes and whatnot, and having the wall scroll of words like in the Star Wars movie. So there's that. <laughs> well, thank God they don't have a trade federation. <laughs> Probably. We don't know. So I think first impressions are in order and let's go in reverse. Toon, what do you think, man? Okay, so I guess it's no secret that Shining Armor is one of my favorite characters in the series. In, in the comics, he seems to get a little better treatment. In this episode... Eh, not not so much. Like the way that they went with this comic, I was I was initially worried because I was not quite sure how he and Blue Blood would get along. And considering that we've only seen Blue Blood once, and he did a marvelous job of leaving a great scathing first impression on us. But okay, maybe this is just me. But my okay, since this is my first impressions and not what I overall think, my first impressions at the end were so. They made Shining look like the idiot, so Blue Blood could be the smart one to save the day at Shining's expense. Okay, then. Pretty much. Okay. That's a great way to treat him. All right. Because I thought it would have been the, the other way around. I thought it would have been Shining, like, being the, the diplomatic one, or at least trying to. But no, Blue Blood has to walk in, and I don't know what kind of 
kind of magic he freaking <laughs> used, but smooth talking, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, second up to bat is Seppi. Even with this comic, even though they tried to glorify Prince Blue Blood, I still hate his character. I don't know why, and maybe this is like the little bit of uh, morality that I have. I don't find having to use manipulation and, like, what was the rule that he said, like, remember everybody's names even the, even if you don't like them or whatever or something like that? Mm-hmm. I just hate that. As smart and charismatic as he appears to be, I still find him a spoiled brat. Well, he's a- That's not a word! Yeah, he is. I know he is. Once again, with the little morality that I still have, I don't commend him for being a- That's not a word! You know, if you leave <laughs> off the- If you leave off the K, you can just say he was an old production company. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh... Deek. <laughs> Which also was a- That's not a word! <laughs> Yeah, especially of how they treated the Sonic franchise. Oh my. Hey, Sonic said AM was awesome. Yes, yeah, it, it was. Everything else after that was terrible. <laughs> uh, and Silver, what about you, man? I'm afraid I'm on the opposite spectrum from Toon. Not that I dislike Shiny Armor, but with both Shiny and, and Cadence, I'm inclined towards disappointments. Uh, I always feel like they, they could be so much more than they are presented. And here, this the cover says friends forever, but what this really is is the Prince Blue Blood micro. This is a celebration and attempt to make Blue Blood more than just the little ponce we saw in uh, the best night ever. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, yes, it does come at the expense of Shining Armor, who is shown to be very buffoonish in his role as Prince, and. Perhaps it even reflects poorly on the the royal family that has not uh, educated him. So more on that as we get into it. And of course, Honestly, it's I of... didn't find him that buffoonish. Like at least he's trying. Sure, he's failing, but he's trying. Uh, we'll, he's we'll, trying to we'll, do this in like an honorable way, is what we'll, I'm trying to say. We'll we'll get to that uh, as we talk about the episode. I will say my opinion of Blue Blood did in fact rise because he's shown as working smarter, not harder. I, too, am not a big fan of his insincerity, but that is, I'm trying very hard not to make a commentary on the current political situation. Trying very hard. And, of course, this stars the Yaks. (laughs) My opinion. My least favorite characters of the season (laughs) and of the series. One of my least favorites, at least. So we have all three princes of this entire show together. And ain't one of them coming out of this looking squeaky clean. So that's the initial impression. It's like, that happened, but... And as for me, I... My opinion of Blue Blood changed in this comic. And like I mentioned before in the Characters We Like and Dislike episode, I have never thought that Blue Blood would be one of my characters to say that, hmm, I like that character. He's interesting. Yes. And in this comic, the way that he portrays himself, the way that... Well, here's here's the thing. First impressions are in order. Never, I don't really have high thoughts about him in this comic, and the cover says it all. Like, uh, is this kind of situation again where Blue Blood is going to stumble and just mess everything up, while Shining Armor has to clean everything up and be the hero? I was wrong. I was totally wrong, and I like it. I like that I was wrong, and. Here we get to see Blue Blood at his element where he's working smarter. He's doing everything he can to, well, gain the system. Or as I like to call it, lie, cheat, and steal. Like how Eddie Guerrero would have done it. Hey, there we go. That's a proper wrestling reference. <laughs> yeah. So. Oh, God. So this is Blue Blood in a nutshell. Like, now I know why I like him. He's Eddie Guerrero. Anyway. Okay, I wouldn't exactly go that far, no. but. When we get when we get to overall thoughts, I'll have I'll have something to say upon that. But anyway, with that, if you have not read this comic, stop here and read it first, and then if you're done, let's continue on. So we start with our presence at the Crystal Empire, where Twilight is teaching. Well, not really teaching, just packing stuff for Shining Armor and getting him ready for the trip to the Yaks country. What was it again? Yakistan. Yep. 
Yeah, so he's telling him about this and that, and just you know, like Twilight being the motherly figure for his bigger brother. You know, all that cute stuff. Oh, that well, that just sounds wrong. I know. It really actually, does. Actually, I, I got to say this. One, you're taking lessons from the from the mayor who nearly started a war with Yakistan last time. <laughs> yep. I, they even point Which that out later. Which was in the comic. Yeah, they pointed that out. So, <laughs> the second thing is that the fact that Twilight has to teach her older brother this stuff the day he's leaving. What has Shining Arm been doing to get ready for his role as Prince? This is why I'm predisposed to disappointments. Shining Armor and Cadence have entered new phases of their lives in very chaotic scenarios. Changeling invasion, saving the, the Crystal Empire, the birth of their daughter nearly killed everyone. They never seem to change or grow as a result of these events. They never push themselves to be more. We're, we, we default back to the fairy tale couple. And now here's Shining Armor basically not knowing a thing about diplomacy and he's just going to rely on his wife. Well, if you think about it, technically, he was just captain of the guard. Just captain? You don't, you don't get to be captain of the guard by just being a soldier. I would have liked to have seen how he became captain, personally. That would have been fun, too. But honestly, uh, in the comic world, Shining Armor is really awesome. He was, well, he was in a band, for God's sakes. He's the guild leader for his D&D group. So he was pretty awesome there, but he doesn't really evolve beyond that point. His glory days are behind him now. He's just the pony in distress. Yeah. Wow, that's fast. Yeah, no, this is why I, I'll never agree with that promise the best night of your life. You peak early, uh, wow, it's all downhill from here. No, I don't want to. I believe the best for people lies in the future. But again, Twilight flat, flat out says, well, you'll have kings with you. He says, thanks, Celestia. If you're not sure what to do, just follow her lead and he's all for that. So guess what has to go wrong? <laughs> uh... She's not coming. Something tells me that he might be the woman of the relationship. <laughs> uh, well, that's that's so freaking not fair to him, though. Like, I think it's been established that, like, well, not actually established what these two can do on their own. I think they should have gotten a Friends Forever to all to themselves so that they could figure out what to do and at least, you know, have something besides, you know, being just there. They deserve better than this, I think. Probably in the future where we get that, like we'll get a Shining Armor and Cadence story. And I think there's going to be a Cadence and Twilight story coming soon, right? It, it'll uh, just yes, come out actually. when this podcast airs. Yeah, so that's going to be awesome to read. I hope it expands Cadence's backstory a little bit more. Besides the story focusing on Twilight for the whole story, like how most friends for every comic like to do. But anyway, crisis ahead. Celestia says that, oh, we need all the princesses to come because... Some big crisis is happening, so we need all of the princesses to be there. And unfortunately for Shining Armor, he has to do this alone? I don't think so, because Prince Blue Blood will join him. Yay. Okay, sh- show of hands, who here wants to see the threat that all four princesses had to face? Me. Me. It I, must have been that important. Yes, I, I'm, I'm kind of assuming everyone's raising their hands. Yep. Yeah. We're, we're not in the same room, <laughs> but... But, uh, yeah, you're, you're setting this up by saying there's a much more interesting story going on over here. You can't see it, but it's there. Totally cool. <laughs> oh, well. It's like Lord of the Rings times 10. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, considering My Little Pony was sort of inspired by that, yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we get blue blood here, and I did... Nope, uh... Blue Blood's first appearance here is no, just full of oh god, please someone kill him. Eh, I wouldn't go that far. Well, considering he's he just sort of starts schmoozing with everyone, then breaks the crystal throne. <laughs> but still, uh, Blue Blood here is well, let's just say he's the buffoon. He plays like he's arrogant. Yes, that too. And well, he, I don't like him here. She's like oh no, but but here like. Shining armor here is like, can we really rely on him? Like, uh, I don't really think that he's right for the job. And Cadence here says, well, I know you can do it, hubby. Just try your best and just do it. No. Norman, go sit in the corner right now. Aww. Although Blue Blood instantly does not endear himself when he remarks on Cadence. Well, I never would have even talked to an orphan pony. <laughs> I was looking for princesses. Uh, but then you go and, and follow up with 
princess, you selfish dipwad. I don't know what else to say without the Sweetie Belle to censor me. Well, if you think about it, uh, during the time when Cadence arrived and timelines and whatnot, she was not a princess. She was kind of an orphan. Oh, no, she, she was a princess. She was adopted by Celestia. She was an alicorn. Really? Already? Yeah, the minute she, the minute she became an alicorn, Celestia appeared before her and adopted her, and she moved to Canterlot. So Blue Blood would have met her after alicornification. Oh, well, that's another reason why I don't really like him. And yet, this is the second time in the comics, uh, this came out just shortly after, uh, Siege of the Crystal Empire, where they've made mention of the fact that Cadence is an orphan, i.e. Disney princess trope number 97. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm wondering if they, if they insist on this, would the comics take the bold step of having Cadence find out about her true parents? Well, it seems that way. The feeling that I got from this, or what you mentioned here, is that the comics are going to explore more of the background for Cadence. And with the Cadence and Twilight story, probably, maybe, who knows? It'll be a brief step for them to do it, I hope. Enough of that, we get on to the trip. Yes, it's the road trip where let's go to Yak Yakistan. And Shining Armor here is ready. He's put on his gear, he's put on his mantle and walking snowshoes and is ready to go. And Blue Blood just laughs at him like, why, why walk when people can carry you? <sighs> and this is where the prickiness of Oh Lord, oh Prince, really, really bothers me. Yep. <laughs> this is the point where it's like I'm on Shining Armor's side the whole way through. Ugh. Really? Because I'm I'm viewing Shining Armor as very inefficient right now. Well, He's... inefficient yet stubborn and honorable, and I admire that. Although I would have also preferred if he had something more efficient. I don't know. Well, I... Maybe it's just him being stubborn because of the fact that. Blue Blood's a spoiled brat, and he doesn't need to be in that same line. I don't know. I appreciate characters with honor, but also intelligence. Right now, Shining is trying to prove his value through feats of physical endurance. Basically, he's more worried about proving his masculinity, whereas Blue Blood is traveling rested, sheltered, and on time. And for all of Shining Armor's trying to prove himself, Blue Blood's entourage are carrying his stuff and the palaquin, and they're moving faster than Shining Armor. Even when the poor guy is trying to prove how macho he is, he's getting schooled. Yeah. At the same time, too, you have to remember that this is what Shining has been doing before, like since he was a guard, guardsman, and he's been in that position, so he doesn't really want to abuse it. He's been through all of that, and he knows how it feels. And yet, even as a guard, he's not performing up to the snuff because the other guards are outpacing him. Yep. With a heavier burden. <laughs> yep. When I look at how the initial, I guess, sort of chemistry between Shining and Blue Blood goes off, you, you do get to see how interesting it is. How, yeah, even though, like, um, Shining's trying to be more uh, solo and trying not to fit into the stereotype of what a prince is, Blue Blood, in that stereotype, is outperforming Shining. And it, this shows right when we get up to where Shining kind of confronts him, and he's just like, okay, listen, just let me do my thing. I don't think he would be best for this. The, the thing that interests me is that Blue Blood kind of takes it as a bit, like, he's a little bit offended at that. And it has me believe that Blue Blood is really not as bad as people make him out to be. I don't think he's being this arrogant on purpose. I think the, sm uh, the smoozing mode is like always on because he believes that's what he's, it's what he does best. It's to make diplomatic decisions and help things move along, that sort of thing. Well, that could be, well, what his cutie marks means because, well, um, how do I put this? Like, cutie marks are meant for a reason and this is Blue Blood's deal. Like, he knows what to do in political situations, which is this. So, yeah. after the whole discussion that they had, they arrive at Yak Yakistan. And Shining um, proceeds to make a fool of himself. Because he arrived late. Yes. How late was it? Like, 
Did, did they mention or no? Like, uh, he, he was, in fairness, only a few minutes behind Blue Blood. So he kept pace, but Blue Blood had already made first introductions and the stronger impression. And I guess that's the weird thing. Blue Blood is approaching this with the attitude of, I don't have anything to prove. Maybe it's because he's done this so long that he knows exactly what to do. God, here I am on Blue Blood's defense against Shining Armor. Jeez. <laughs> uh, uh, this episode, this ep- uh, not this episode, this comic <laughs> makes it hard for me to be on Shining's side. <laughs> well, that's because Shining is trying to prove a lot of stuff, but, you know, that that is his inexperience. In a way, going. he fails. <laughs> I don't like any of them. I hate this comic. Oh, God, no. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. <sighs> well, well. For me here, like, this whole scenario of Blue Blood here introducing himself and uh, apologizing for Shining Armor for being late. And, well, it doesn't really give a good impression towards Shining. And you, I, I have the feeling here that Blue Blood is trying to smoothen things out by saying how Shining is not really the sharpest tool in the shed. And, well... Blue Blood here says, or Blue Blood requests that, oh, um, could my men stay in your barracks or something like that for they have worked really hard and they need rest. And the Yaks comply. And now they walk to the throne room and, like you mentioned before, let me do all the talking and you can just sit behind and watch. Blue Blood says, okay, let's see what you can do. And immediately fail because of how inexperienced Shining Armor is and different cultures. He does not know what to do and he fails all the way. In fact, we, we kind of get yeah. a rehash of uh, Party Pooped where the Yaks just like, they just smash everything. But there's a reason for that too because <laughs> remember when in Party Poop we mentioned that, oh, the Yaks were being offended because of how they were treating everything because they're not doing things right. But they should have been more uh, lenient because their guest is trying really, really hard. Now you're just coming to my land and insulting my culture. Bad. Very bad. I'm still of the view that you can recognize the spirit in which it was intended. Hell, they get mad that Shining does well at a sport. If that doesn't show that they're just a group of insecure children. The Yaks, yep, they are. Yeah, yeah very yeah. much. Uh, now here's the thing. This is kind of political because when... You play a game with a head figure. You want to make them look good. So you play to your best, but not the very best. You make it look good enough for them to have a challenge, but let them win. So people would say, oh my god, the uh, Prince Hufferford was really good. Uh, but here's my thing, Norman. You're, you're basically, again, why is everyone always making excuses for the acts? I agree that Shining probably would have been smart for him to let the Yaks win. That would have been a good tactic that he did not think of. But here, the Yaks come to Equestria and they break everything. <laughs> the Yaks, co- you come to the Yaks home and they break all the stuff you brought. This is such an egocentric culture. I keep asking, why does anyone want to interact with them? They have nothing to offer. Except food and like trade and I guess some resources that they could use. And friendship. I'm not even. Fluffy coats. Oh, with, with this kind of friendship where you're always making concessions and bowing just to keep them at peace, that's not friendship. Uh, I don't know how to. <laughs> this is one of those scenarios where. Norman, don't, because he's right. Norman, I'm sorry, I'm don't sorry, but. Don't forget that Silver is always right. <laughs> oh, oh, how I wish that could be true. Uh, <laughs> Norman, I, I don't mean to take this out on you. In American culture, there's a lot of pushback about respecting things. And there comes a point where I'm like, there's respect and then there's also a sense of surrender. And I feel like there are times where you have to say, no, I cannot support this viewpoint. It's an opposition to what I believe is very critical. So as everyone has tried so hard to defend the Yaks, to explain their their culture, to explain their perspective, I ultimately come down to, they break your stuff and threaten you. They're just not worth the effort. Well, true that. But in this scenario here, they're trying to be very diplomatic. And uh, it, it, this is... They what, are? I, this is something... No, they aren't. I mean, the, for the pony side, not the yak oh, side. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. But it's, I hate to bring in real world politics, but the yaks are sort of the equivalent to Iraqians. In a way, we give them money, we give them food and sources, and they just... And they still want to kill us. 
Well, uh, well, it's like that. let's. I wouldn't go to that extreme. I okay, know I said. okay. So there are elements well, within that culture. It's in that a similar it. light, is what I'm thinking. If, I guess I'm not 100 sure. But the thing is, with this, with with the yaks here, they're really a shut in. They don't really expand. They don't really evolve from their cultures, and they don't have outside world knowledge. That's how I'm looking at them. And to me, I'm just looking at them as very pitiful creatures. I wouldn't even say pitiful. I'd just say annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, it's not an excuse. Uh, yeah. I had to actually restrain myself a little bit because someone else wanted to come out and talk about this, but I'm not going to let that happen during this podcast. I have a little bit more professionalism than letting him come out for this. Anyway, continue, please. Yeah. <laughs> well. Oh, him. On a more positive note, we get our first female yak. Yeah. She looks... Oh. She looks So beautiful. it's not a sausage party up in the <laughs> castle. It ain't all sausage. <laughs> and here's the thing. She's actually not breaking stuff. Well... So, I, as far as I can tell, adorable little yaks that open the door and welcome you in, and kindly yaks that do hoof cures it's the grown-up dudes that are the trouble. Yeah. I, I, well, yeah, because they're all masculine dudes. We're got to break stuff because we're masculine, yo. Yeah. Yo. But still, but still. Err, brother. <laughs> oh, God, no. <laughs> Don't put in Hogan and... Yak, yak, no, I will, I will. What you gonna do, brother, when Yak Yakistan <laughs> runs wild on you? <laughs> Something tells me Randy Savage has came in, has come uh, into the I think the that's podcast. Hogan. It's Hulk Hogan. <laughs> uh, but why well, is think Randy Savage with that type of voice? Oh, uh, well, never mind. <laughs> Let's carry on. So, yeah, we we get the Prince Blue Blood's Guide to Diplomacy. <laughs> oh, God. This is where my opinion of him changed because the thing that he does here is ingenious. Get to know their friends. Winning over a diplomat's friend means they're hearing good things about you when you're not around. That's smart. Really, really smart. Bring food, but don't bring their food and don't claim it's their best. Make it something they'll be curious about. Yes, and this is the Griffins. That way, if they hate it, nobody has to be insulted. You can bond over how terrible they are. So then he can that be... That kind of seems to... like a... No, go ahead, Silver, sorry. That's a so, dick move. So he get, basically gets to be racist towards the Griffins. Species is. <laughs> so yes. Technically, it's ingenious. Remember every pony's name at all times. It shows pony that you care, even if you don't. Uh, and my good opinion of him just went out the window. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, yeah, he's basically... Yeah, especially over the old yell elderly yak lady that was being oh so nice and giving him a hoof a cure really but here's the thing guys this is diplomacy or manipulation 101 you get to them to get what you want and in this case what blue blood wants is friendship between the yaks and ponies it's ingenious i don't care if it's ingenious it's mean but you don't know you won't know. I don't approve either way. But Seppi, you won't know. If this happens to you, you will never know. Uh, but then again, if you learn this perspective, then you can never truly trust his sincerity. That's the double... Trust me, I've, I've dealt with that type of people. But here's the thing, Silver, because with Blue Blood here, he's friends with everyone, and nobody's saying bad things about him. This is what they say. Like, he says this. Winning, o winning over diplomats, friend, means they're hearing good things about you, and even you're not around. See? That's genius. I don't care if Actu it's genius. I hate it. Actually, here's, there's an important distinction here. He's not friends with anyone. He says nice things and people like him, but no one really calls him a friend. He's basically known to all but friend to none. And believe it or not, that too gains a reputation over time. Well, true that. That can be sucky at point. But still, it gets the job done. And I'm saying here that I don't agree in his method. But I'm saying his methods are ingenious. All right. Well, let it... Tune, do you want to wait? We've all sort of chimed in on this. Well, with the Prince Blue Blood thing, I am not... I'm not exactly behind it because I feel it's a little bit false. 
I feel that if you're not being sincere about it, well, actually, no, I think it's fair that he acted like this because the acts were, I guess, stupid enough to fall under uh, Blue Blood spell. I don't think I can say this. I gotta let him take over. <clears throat> so yeah, hi, cartoons here. I'm just gonna fill in for this little bit. So Blue Blood is actually a mastermind. This guy knows exactly what to do. He knows how to talk people up. He knows how to get things done. Cause at the end of the day, as much of a D-I-C-K as he was, the problem was resolved. He knew what he was doing. The guy's a lot smarter than we think. I mean, Macy has a little bit of a, a little bit of an emotional backstory to him that we may not know about, which would be nice to know because I feel that would give him some depth. But at the end of the day, he does what he's supposed to do. Smoozes up, gets the things done, and granted, man, Shining was such an idiot in this, in this little comic. It was great. I mean, Tooney talks all the time about how Shining's his favorite character. Well, I think he likes Blue Blood just a little bit because as, as bad of a character as he was at first, again, he got stuff done. At the end of the day, it's all that matters. I agree with that statement there. There we go. And, uh, I'm suddenly thinking back on that movie Zorro. Who? Oh? Where there, there's a line, uh, what is it? Being cultured is simply the art of saying one thing and thinking another. <laughs> so the truth is we never really get to know the real blue blood. That's the, that's the weird thing in all of this. For all his friendliness to shining armor or his, I don't have anything to prove. For all we know, by the end of the comic, he still can hold shining armor in complete contempt and, and we would never know it. He may not even respect the princesses despite his praise. Especially Cadence. I mean, I know we don't like Cadence Silver, but still, though. Oh, who cares about Cadence? Cadence doesn't do Jack around here anymore. Maybe the next comic will be good, but... Let's hope for something good. But with peace treaty done, trade route established, uh, they enjoy a hearty meal, and our prince are off their way back to the Crystal Empire to bring in the good news. Yay. Oh, we we completely glossed over one fact. Oh, which is? Shining's negotiation contract was so rejected that he had to give 100 pounds of crystal corn just to avoid war again. <laughs> this is what I mean about the yaks. I feel like we, we've introduced the elephant in the room. We should address it. Safi, you mentioned you view them as a... Because yak, yakistan sounds like Afghanistan, or some people believe it's a Middle East view. Some view them as a Mongolian horde culture. I don't think they indicate one particular culture, but I just rankle under the idea that you keep, we keep making excuses if someone has violent intentions. There comes a point where someone needs to walk up to these yaks, say, smack them across the face and say, try and declare war. You won't make it five feet. That's also true, because when you think about it, the ponies could have destroyed them easily. And this is funny. When I, when I criticize the yaks uh, for party poops, a lot of people started to say, well, you don't know if they have shamans or mystics or anything behind those walls. It's like, even if they did, you've got princesses who raised the sun and the moon. They would dwarf anything the yaks had to offer. I, there's no way I can view the yaks as more powerful as a military or magic force. When you take a look, see at what the yaks has, like in terms of what we see, to put it this way is what you see is what you get. They're that. The only thing that they have going for them is brute force. And brute force is not enough to win the war. Am I missing anything? At the end, Shining asked Blue Blood to teach him to be an ambassador, which, <coughs> depending on your view of Blue Blood's methods, Shining could be asking, can you teach me insincerity? <laughs> uh, well, good. Maybe Dorkulius can learn a thing or two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree with you, my friend. Uh, well, but still... You agree with Toon's e evil alter ego? Yes, why not? I love how I introduced myself in here, and there was, like, no reaction. I found that amazing, because I, I guess people are just now getting used to me being here. <laughs> well, I have Silver Quill on every week, so, yeah. Dude, I am my alter ego. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh. Also, Sylvie, hi, how you doing? He's evil enough <laughs> as he is. Oh, well, I, I, last week I got... Last podcast I got to... Try to ruin a Christmas carol. Now I'm getting to praise an insincere uh, <laughs> manipulator. It's a good month. That's what makes yeah. the world go round. <laughs> uh, the first half of this month has been really evil. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, with that, the comic ends. 
And yes, on to final thoughts. So, Tune, can we have him back? Oh, okay. Yeah, go, go and go and mess with somebody else. Okay. Okay, so my honest thoughts in this comic. So, after getting over my initial feelings about this, I do actually like this comic. I think the way that they went about it, I wasn't too in favor of, but I understand why they had to do it. To be fair, it could have been any other character at, at um, Shining's expense. I would have been interested to see if it was Cadence in the Shining spot, because I'm pretty sure this would go a completely different way. That being said, though, with I think the best part of this comic is the whole guide to diplomacy thing. And I do like I, – I honestly do like how uh, Blue Blint went about it. I think that Shining could have probably learned a thing or two. And maybe this wouldn't have gone so bad had they not – had Shining not messed up. But this is a point that I bring up in uh, my Newbie Dash uh, review. If there's perfection, there is no conflict. So there has to be a flaw. There has to be some kind of problem going on. There has to be something that a character is not used to doing or not skilled at in order for there to be a conflict in the first place. So this is a learning experience. Maybe the next time that we see these two characters, they'll – well, maybe Shining will be better at what he does, and maybe we'll get to see more of Blue Blood in the future. Uh, we'll get to see more of a personal side to him, which I feel will bring some depth to him. So I did enjoy this comic. There were a few issues, but overall, it's still good. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And Seppi, what about you? Uh, Let's see. With this comic, I went in this comic like expecting, oh, everybody likes Blue Blood. Okay, I let's see. Try to impress me. Yeah, you didn't impress me. At the end of the day, I don't think I came out of this comic liking anyone. I mean, sure, I was more empathetic towards Shining Armor, but that was pretty much it. Other than that, that's how I feel about this comic. All right. And Silver, what about you? Well, let's see here. By comic's end, it turns out there was at least one thing that was true about the cover. Because the cover, it makes it look like Blue Blood is going to disrespect Shining Armor. He's going to treat him as less than a prince. And there'll be this tension. Truthfully, the, the, the problem was on Shining Armor's side more than anything. Or if Blue Blood does hold Shining Armor in contempt, he hides it really well. However, yeah. the comic it is right that Blue Blood is the number one prince. He is the best diplomat. He avoids war and gets the yaks to open up to pony culture. He doesn't rely on violence or threats. He's basically outshines both Rutherford and Shining Armor. And that's why I call this the Prince Blue Blood Micro. Though he's introduced, he's introduced in a negative light, but by the end, he's the only one who gets to shine. And I find it fascinating that is through insincerity in a culture that punishes you for having a negative attitude. You know, you're a little too boisterous like Trixie or you have a rough history like Gilda. Everyone sort of scorns you uh, or Starlight Glimmer. So here's Blue Blood kind of flying under everyone's radar. He can be just as if he wants to be mean spirited, he can, but he knows how to. Spin it so you're never sure. You don't admire him for the, for his ethics, but you sort of admire the duplicity. Unfortunately, yeah. for for Blue Blood to rise, Shining must fall. I've become less optimistic about could this work better next time? Because if there's one thing I've noted about the comics is that there is no emotional carryover. The events of Reflections, Siege of the Crystal Empire, Nightmare Rarity, none of the characters have had to wrestle with the aftermath of those events or second guess themselves. It's like we hit a reset button every time. And so I'm concerned that shining armor, though he expresses a desire in learning will go back to being basically buffoon in diplomatic matters because he's trying so hard to prove his value by with physical exertion as a member of a Royal guard would, he doesn't even get to do that because again, he's shown up by, by blue blood's entourage. As for me, like I mentioned earlier before that initial impressions were not good until the end. And as you can hear me for throughout the whole review, I like Blue Blood. I, I like how he acts. He is one of those people who has a high charisma in their D&D charts. I would say chaotic neutral with a high charisma level. They can do almost anything. They, they're just jerks. But when push comes to shove, they're there. They get things done. Ends justify the means. Yes. And Blue Blood here, avoiding war, does a great job. And 
we get to at least know what he thinks. So in the end, I like Blue Blood because of how he get things done. Overall, <laughs> I don't want to do anything with him. Uh, but well, that's my opinion on the comics. I say it's an awesome read. Don't follow what he does because that's not how you want to live life like. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so the moral of this comic, learn to smooth, learn how to talk right to people, learn how to manipulate your way to getting stuff done, and in the end, everything went as planned. I don't, da, 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 da. I don't think that's yeah. the lesson you should take, but yay. Well, that's the comic within itself. That's it in a nutshell. Makes sense. Can we, the next time we see Shining Armor, can we please give him something to do other than look like the idiot? Please, I'm tired of seeing one of my favorite characters get treated like crap. Yeah, I, I can agree because, well, Shining Armor in the... What was now he knows how Spike feels. <laughs> yeah, well, well, Spike doesn't matter anyway. Oh, oh Spike! Oh <laughs> okay. no. Okay. What, what was the episode where? No, what was the comic where Shining Armor and Cadence hook up? Oh, nay, anything. That was the, yeah. Nay, anything. Nay, anything. Nay, anything. Shining Armor was awesome. Uh, well, he. Well, he still he looks a, like an idiot at some points. But he was. It's a, a door. It's a cute but, kind but of door. Right? It's a endearing buffoonery. Yeah. I'll tell you this much. Hmm? I think he does really well in the Nay Anything arc, and he also does really well in the often overlooked Friends Forever number seven, I think? That's with Twilight? I could be wrong. Yeah, the, yeah, the one with yeah. uh, Twilight and the one that they're downstairs in the castle, like, figuring stuff out. Yeah, yeah. That oh, one right. I, thought really I have well that too. comic. Like, I have a physical copy of that comic. I know what you're talking about. I like that one, too. I mean, the comic's... Uh, portray Shining in a good light, but sometimes he's the butt of the joke, or he has to get the... He has to be the jobber just to make someone else look good. And, uh, well, c'est la vie. But anyway, next week, what are we going to review? Next week, we're going back to the episode. We're going to review Season 6, Episode 9, The Saddle Row Review. Original air date, May 21st, 2016. Written by Nick Conflone. And, well... In this episode, Rarity opens her shop in Manhattan, and... Nick Conflown has had a good role this season, I swear. And, well, um, we'll save the synopsis for when we reach that episode. So anyway, um, this is here. We reached the end. Um, as for the reading the reviews thingy, uh, this week we have none because I blew the whole thing on the previous one. Bad idea. Actually, I have one. Oh, really, no? Uh, once again, from Sidril Mundet. Mm-hmm. So Norman wants to blow up California? Lex Luthor did it first. <laughs> wow. I didn't so, mean it that way. Okay. Norman, would you like to say anything to the good people of California? Uh, <laughs> Do you want to apologize to Golden Fox and Keyframe for attempting to blow them up? Do you want to apologize to DeWil- to DeWil Snyder, our blue spy? I'm sorry. I promise. Do you want to apologize to the? Do you want to? Do you want to apologize to the people who are who are never now ever going to go to San Diego Comic Con? <laughs> California is no more. They're, you're not just ruining Brony's lives. You're ruining. You know. You're, you're ruining everyone's lives, including Hollywood. <laughs> Inclu- do you want movies to stop? Do you not want any more movies, Norman? Like, if they're anything like some of the movies we've seen, then yes. <laughs> <laughs> the, you, you kind of lost my support with the Hollywood thing. It's like you know we could use it. We could use a little shaking up of new talent. Maybe, maybe can we like just blow up Hollywood, the studios? <laughs> so Silver, like we should. Never mind, Norman. You're doing a good thing in that sense. <laughs> can oh, we, come everything on. else is shame on you. With an with an overly elaborate crystal crystal uh, continent no. scheme. <laughs> And Christ, um, and Christ figure to imagery. And we're going to hang it over California so that no one can escape and make them starve to death, just like in the Simpsons movie. <laughs> oh god, you got me there. Uh, I didn't mean it that way, that was taken out of context. Oh god. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, Sidril, I, I hope you had a good laugh because yay. Oh god. Uh, so anyway, you can <laughs> join us next week as we banter on for more episode reviews and uh, have jokes at my expense. I have been Norman Sanzo. 
I am the Silver Creel. I am Sapphire Heartsong. I'm Tune and Create, keeping totally tuned for your entertainment. And we'll guys catch you next week. See ya. Adios. Bye bye. I didn't mean it that way. What he said. <laughs> I think things were taken out of context. Oh wait, I have family in California. Norman, I'm going to beat you up until you stop trying to take over California. I didn't. Aww. <laughs>